Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Justin Essary, Assistant Professor at Rice University. Uh, welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. Uh, the IMC is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. Uh, this week, we have a, uh, a roundtable uh, discussing the job market for uh, graduate students in political science inside and outside <clears throat> of academia. And uh, I'm going to let them all introduce themselves, but for now, I just want to tell you that after everyone introduces themselves and we have a few introductory questions uh, for about uh, 20 or 30 minutes, uh, we will be taking questions from you uh, so you can ask your questions about how to get involved in, in these different career paths. Uh, you can call in <clears throat> to ask a question on the air at our toll-free call-in line, which is 1-855-667-8287, which is also 1-855-NO-STATS. Uh, you can email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Uh, finally, uh, you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, for our viewers outside the U.S., uh, we recommend using the Ask Question box to ensure that we receive your questions immediately. Sometimes Gmail is a little bit delayed. Uh, and so, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, start off by um, uh, going around the, uh, just actually let me mention one other thing. We have another uh, panelist who's, who's literally coming from class, so, so Marianne Gallagher might, uh, will probably introduce herself last. Uh, but uh, while we're waiting for that, uh, I'd like to um, go around the, the, t the virtual table uh, and have you uh, introduce yourself, uh, mention where you got your uh, PhD and what year, and what area you studied, maybe maybe a little something about uh, your specialization in your dissertation. Uh, the current position that you, uh, that you're, that you hold now, uh, what field you're in, and a brief description of, of what you do. So uh, I don't know if you guys see, uh, are we all in the same order on each other's screens? Actually, I don't know that, whether that's true, but um, we'll start with uh, Michael. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, I'm Michael Malecki. I'm a product manager and an engineer at Crunch.io um, and affiliated with the survey research company YouGov. Uh, I work with an all remote team spread across the Eastern Hemisphere uh, so far. Uh, and until I moved to Chicago this summer, um, I, w I taught data visualization in uh, Columbia University's uh, Data Science Institute. Uh, my usual quick response to what I do is I mostly write software. Um, in reality, I both design what we're writing and work with a team of other developers. A few of us are social scientists. There's more than a couple uh, political science PhDs among us. A few are pure software engineers. Uh, I'm one of our full, our full stack engineers. I work predominantly in Python uh, and lately a bunch in JavaScript. In terms of how I got here, um, I did a political science PhD in comparative politics at Washington University in St. Louis, finishing in 2010. Uh, I studied European Union back when that was a thing. Um, <laughs> I spent most of my time coding and fitting Bayesian uh, multi-level models with various MCMC tools. Uh, from there, in 2010, I joined Andrew Gelman's group at Columbia as a postdoc at the very beginning of the awesome STAN project. Um, there, I worked mostly with survey data, uh, becoming somewhat of an Americanist because we have better survey data than most places, although I'm a little too familiar with the Euro barometer. Um, doing stuff with Mr. P, multi-level regression, and post-stratification. Um, there is an MRP R package uh, that's on GitHub but not CRAN. Um, in, uh, I joined YouGov halfway through a two-year postdoc there and remained tangent to applied statistics. Uh, YouGov fields surveys online. They are polling for CBS. They did the New York Times um, giant surveys of you know 75,000 Americans times five or six waves. Um, my analytics team, most of who are now with me at Crunch.io, weighted surveys, prepared reports at, with PDFs, and eventually we wrote a web interface that was backed by R in a production environment which is kind of crazy. Um, and in 2013, we spun out of YouGov with their support uh, to build a platform to manage these kind of data sets. So we've been doing that for the last couple of years, uh, which means writing a database, uh, a programming interface for it, and a, I think a pretty slick web client that lets, lets us build the, the tools that we wish we had as analysts, uh, as political scientists, 
um, as well as clients in Python and R because we are familiar with those. Uh, finally, I would say graduate school prepared me really well for working independently and with a remote team. Uh, I meet a lot of engineers who say I couldn't work with a remote team because I would get bored at home. And I'm like, well, I wrote a PhD mostly sitting at home. <laughs> um, <laughs> The pace of software engineering is a lot faster than academic work. I just had an MRP paper come out with Jeff Lax and Justin Phillips uh, in June that we started work on in 2010, which is crazy. Um, at Crunch, we ship code continuously. Uh, my role as a domain expert is I've you know, analyzed a lot of surveys, which means making a whole lot of cross tabs in my day, and I get to design and write the tools that I, that I want, always wanted to have uh, that it turns out are kind of hard to do. <laughs> I can top that, Michael. I just had a paper come out in AJPS that I started in 2005. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Uh, well, uh, thank you. I'm just I'm sorry. I'm just reminiscing a little bit. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Emily, why don't you go ahead next? I am Emily Hinken Ritter. Um, I'm a 2010 PhD from Emory University in Atlanta. Um, as many of us in this panel are, are we? <laughs> the um, so I um, my field is international relations and comparative politics. I do research on how international institutions affect domestic conflict between the state and its population, especially repression and dissent dynamics. I use formal modeling and um, mostly quantitative analysis to um, examine those questions, although I'm not limited in those ways. Um, my first, and I'm an academic, so in this panel um, I am a, a research academic, which is kind of what we all in our PhD studies are trained to do, um, our, and all of our programs push us to do, but obviously it's not the only option that's available to us, so um, I'm here for comparison. And my first job was at the University of Alabama um, as an assistant professor there, um, which is um, a research institute with 2-2 teaching load. And I um, did three years of my first um, tenure track position there, and then I went on the academic market again. And now I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of California, Merced. Um, in terms of what I generally do, uh, what my days look like. Um, and my current teaching load, which is lighter than, um, I'm a 2-1 teaching load here. And so um, my uh, I spend three quarters of my time doing research and then one quarter of my time doing teaching prep and actual execution. Um, and um, my research days are long and hard and awesome. So. Um, uh, I'll pass it on to. Okay, thanks. Uh, Susan, you want to go ahead? Um, my name is Susan Smilser. Uh, I have a PhD in political science from Emory University as well. I'm a 2015 PhD. I just finished last month. Um, and I study American political institutions. Um, my Thank you. <laughs> uh, my dissertation looked at the evolution of dissenting opinions in the Supreme Court from 1790 through the present, and um, I just use a lot of I used a lot of different methods in the dissertation, writing various scripts to scrape data from the web, um, writing custom scripts to calculate various measures of things in opinions, basically coding text as data. Um, I also uh, had a formal model and some large and quantitative tests, so. Um, all in all, it was a pretty mixed methods endeavor. Um, my research focus is on the federal courts. So after I entered candidacy at Emory, I actually left Atlanta, and I began working at the Congressional Research Service in uh, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I was an analyst on the federal judiciary, and th all this meant was that I responded to queries from members of Congress and their staffs on basically any topic relating to the federal judiciary. So if it touched the courts and wasn't law, it came to me and a, a colleague. Um, so most of my work concerned answering requests related to the judicial appointment process. Um, I taught seminars during the Kagan and Sotomayor um, confirmation processes uh, for staffers. Um, I answered questions about courthouses, workload, whatever Congress was interested in. Um, I also 
from the data perspective, I was the quantitative person on the team. And when I say quantitative, I, I mean kind of a light descriptive quantitative. Um, and I maintained the agency's judicial nominations database. Um, in addition, in 2010, I was also deta detailed to the Senate Impeachment Trial Committee. So in 2009 and 2010, the House impeached two judges, one resigned, one fought his impeachment, and the Senate tried that impeachment. And I was the social scientist on the committee that helped um, try and bring kind of a quantitative analysis aspect to figuring out what the Senate was supposed to do. So looking at historical um, trials and then trying to figure out how we should apply that to the current trial. I left CRS in 2011 um, and I started law school at NYU. I'm currently in my third year. Um, I came to NYU as a Furman Scholar, which is um, a program designed to train legal academics. I was chosen primarily because of my quantitative training. And um, next year I'll join an antitrust boutique, um, Axon Veltrop and Harkwriter, as a first year antitrust associate. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, antitrust law is actually a pretty interesting blend of social science and law, as most of the um, doctrine is an application of economic theory. And so in my summer there, I spent a lot of time reading uh, economics theory, formal, formal models, um, and doing kinds of research that regular law students wouldn't be able to do because of my game theoretic and quantitative training. Um, so I'm happy to talk about both of those careers and both of those paths. Um, graduate school prepared me for them in different ways, but I feel like I've been talking for about three minutes, so I will pass it on to the next person. Uh, all right, uh, thank you. Uh, Nathan, you want to go ahead? Sure, I'm Nathan Daneman. Um, See, so yeah, I finished my PhD also from Emory in 2013, so about two years ago. Um, the first, most of the two years uh, thereafter, uh, I've been working in Washington, D.C. as a data scientist. Um, I worked for a company called Data Tactics that did contract and consulting based work for the federal government, mostly in the defense and intelligence spaces. Um, uh, what that implied kind of varied a lot from project to project, um, which was part of the uh, part of the pros and cons of it. Um, sometimes the projects were uh, very short-lived, like a month, and involved building a quick prototype or helping a customer figure out um, if a question was answerable. Sometimes they're very long projects. The, the longest was almost um, uh, more like a year, and it involved um, doing a bunch of research and development, um, looking at the question of whether or not you could catch uh, people doing bad things in huge and fast-moving cyber data in near real time. Um, uh, I also, during that time, was involved in um, projects with a lot of breadth, which was um, fun and challenging. So I, I did um, some geospatial analysis. Uh, I was also involved with some text-based research. I had several overlapping projects that dealt with social media. Um, when I say projects, most of these things involve a uh, customer, you know, some government entity has this data, they have no idea what can be squeezed out of it, or they think they know, but they're probably wrong, and you help give them a sense of what could be learned from this data, and then potentially make them a small one-off tool or report to answer their questions, or you make them a large and uh, persistent tool so that they can answer these questions for themselves on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, I guess then, um, about two and a half months ago, I moved uh, out of that world um, into private industry where I'm still a data scientist, uh, but now I work uh, for a company called IronNet Cybersecurity. We're productizing some of that, um, some of that uh, cybersecurity research that I mentioned before, um, aimed at Fortune 100 companies. Um, now my role is very different, whereas previously I'd worked on everything from um, Cleaning the data to cleaning it to analyzing it to putting out reports and doing front-end development. Uh, now I'm kind of squarely one cog in a, a big 50-person technical team, and I, I do the algorithm kind of test and development and optimization piece, uh, and then other people do the data stuff before me and then the visualization stuff after that. I'm happy to take questions um, on both kind of the government contracting piece specifically and also the data scientist piece uh, more generally. Great. Uh, and um, Jay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jay Yanamidi. I got my PhD in political science from Penn State in 2013, and I heard Phil Schroeder is on the call. He was my uh, advisor. 
So thank you, Phil. Uh, I've since then I've been at uh, various companies, so as large public, small public startup, and now I'm at Google. Uh, so I'm a data scientist at Google, and I focus on intellectual property. So uh, I meet a lot with business folks and legal folks and machine learning people and database people, and try to sort of synthesize all of them into uh, you know, efficient machine learning, data-driven uh, um, IP and legal tools. Uh, and uh, yeah, so in my grad school, I focused primarily on forecasting political instability, uh, using a lot of event data approaches, and, and the statistical machine learning training uh, was uh, has been important in uh, you know, enabling me to be in the private sector. Uh, happy to answer any questions. So I, I do consulting, some consulting projects on the side too. Um, so I've touched a lot of uh, data science uh, areas in the for-profit domain. All right. Um, well, Marianne's having some trouble uh, getting on board technically, so we're going to continue to try to get her on the call. But um, while we're waiting for that, I think we'll just go ahead and, and just uh, ask some. I'll have some questions I, I'd like uh, to to pose to each of our uh, panelists. So um, I guess the the most important thing from the perspective of uh, an ABD, or two most important things, is. Uh, what you should be uh, doing in graduate school to prepare for a career in your field, and then how do you break into a career in in that field once you once you are are, uh, are once you're ready? So um, the first question I'll ask is, what are the most important skills uh, you developed in graduate school that you think you you make the most use of in your career, and what do you wish you had spent more time uh, working on in grad school that you then had to catch up on once you uh, entered in your career? We'll just go around the table, uh, starting with Michael. Hmm. Most important tool. So I view a lot of my sort of projects that I worked on in grad school, one of which is still uh, possibly ongoing, um, collecting a whole bunch of data about the, uh, the uh, legislature in the Slovak Republic, because they have a database that is scrapable for all kinds of stuff. Um, anyway, <laughs> tangent. Um, it, it was an opportunity to uh, develop just skills at working with lots of different types of data, develop tools. I wrote uh, R packages to automate things uh, because the first virtue of a programmer is laziness. Um, if you do something twice, you should write a package for it. Um, right, fine. Do something twice, write a function, do something three times, turn your function into a package. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I pass the ball. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Happy to, happy to engage with, with other uh, other parts of the question. I just uh, <laughs> I don't know how to go first there. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Emily. So um, obviously you need to know how to do research and you know how to publish and you need to know you know you need to do all the things that you do as an academic. Uh, I think the things that are probably that have been most useful for me getting a job. Um, as an academic have been um, how to give a really good talk and how to write and convey a really compelling puzzle. So um, I think that, th that these are things that, that might be a little unusual to, to think about um, as something that's really important and that I am actually pretty introverted um, and don't um, always do well talking in groups personally, you don't feel comfortable doing it. And so, and that's pretty common among our types, our social science types. And so um, I had to work really hard to develop skills that made it so that I performed really well in talks and handled Q&A in a particularly adroit way that helps convey my um, abilities and my um, my research in ways that are useful in both conferences and then also in job talks. Conferences being even more important because those are how you get the job talks. People see you and um, are impressed with your research and your thinking abilities. Um, so uh, working on talks and how to be, give a really, really good talk makes a big difference. Um, and then also to write and convey a really compelling puzzle and to do that in a way that signals the way that your research contributes to the world and also the way that your research is interesting and exciting and new. Um, and to do that in just a couple of sentences 
is a, a very difficult thing to do, but also is the most important part of your application. It's the most important part of every one-on-one -on -one meeting you make, every elevator ride you take, every uh, person you meet for coffee um, at conferences and things like that, and those are all things that help you get a job. So it's it's even less about the way in which you do the research, unfortunately, but um, even more so about your way to kind of frame a puzzle quickly and very compellingly. So those are skills I would say are really important. It's interesting that um, often you uh, you get told something like, oh, you know, methods, you get as much methods as you can, but the things that you were mentioning as as things one needs to develop are, are very interpersonal, um, which I, I would say uh, stereotypically is not uh, what you would think of as a strength of, of academics. Exactly. <laughs> Which is why I highlight them as things that you need to work on in practice. <laughs> Susan? Um, so at the Congressional Research Service at CRS, 100% the best thing that I learned at grad school was data management. Um, so thinking about a project, like figuring out what variables I needed and being able to manage those, like manage the collection of that over a long period of time. Essentially, the project of a dissertation is what I kind of managed on a daily basis in maintaining our judicial um, nominations database, which I did not start and somebody else is maintaining now. And so there was also an element of creating continuity to it. So thinking critically about you know, the process of doing that um, I thought was very important. Um, as a law student, I will have to say that there is not a day that goes by that my data analysis 101 class or 508 for those of those Emory grads in the panel um, does not serve me incredibly well and so do not undervalue kind of the basic um, training that you get and it, I mean it's as simple as like thinking about where selection effects exist in the real world and how a collection of cases you're looking at um, can totally shape or misshape your conclusions about the state of the doctrine or about what judges are actually doing um, in a way that I think people who haven't had that sort of training don't think about. So even if you don't end up going into something that's like a data scientist or, you know, programmer, um, you applying even the basic assumptions of kind of quantitative methodology can serve you well in, in things that are inherently not quantitative or mathematical. Um, so I would, and, and if you go into a field like law, um, it will always be novel, which is like always con continuously blows my mind that by talking about things like selection effects or um, endogeneity or the idea that the concept of autocorrelation um, happens in the real world, which is why we measure it. Um, but lawyers don't think that way. So if you do want to take a legal path, um, understanding how to conceptually think about the law in terms of your methodological training will serve you very, very well. Uh, Nathan, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are several ways guys will kind of prepared me for my current gig, and then several things that I've had to kind of scramble to, to catch up with, kind of after the fact and on the fly. Um, so one thing that, that was obviously super helpful is how to think like a social scientist. Um, uh, just all the things that I think Susan really just just mentioned, and being able to um, convey those ideas to lay audiences. So. Much like lawyers probably don't think hard about endogeneity, colonels don't think very much about um, the rigorous communication of uncertainty and measurements. Uh, so that's been a big part of things. Um, I also just want to give a big second to what Emily was saying a moment ago that um, some of the soft skills prep that I got um, in grad school has been super helpful because as I'm sure Michael can probably attest to, maybe Jay as well, um, there's uh, a pretty small kind of intersection in the uh, Venn diagram between people who have high-end technical skills and coding skills and people who you can put in front of an, an audience. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to do both of those things is, um, has worked out really nicely for me. Um, getting familiar with lots of different ways to go about coding, uh, I hadn't really thought about this at the time, but um, getting familiar with Stata and then very, very shortly after that R and Winbugs and LaTeX and um, all these things help me to think about um, not learning a programming language at a time, but how programming languages in general work, which you can then apply very quickly. I've had to learn <laughs> I've had to learn two different ones in the last three months just to kind of keep up with um, 
with things and with projects. So that that's been handy. Um, I think one of the biggest biggest things as well that grad school prepared me for is uh, developing the uh, the toughness, the mental toughness, and also just the um, unintimidableness. Man, that's definitely not a word. Uh, the idea <laughs> that you can see a, a big challenge and not be um, overwhelmed by it, but just roll up your sleeves and dig into it and and get to those answers because either someone else has answered that question before and you can find the answer, or you'll come up with something yourself. Um, things that were pretty lacking, um, and it's no fault of grad schools, but just um, the fault of the, the big diff between the career I chose and, and the training I got. Uh, the first is dealing with big, big data. So I'm sure lots of people in the audience know what to do if they get asked to run a logistic regression, but they probably don't know what to do if the data they want to run that logit on doesn't fit on one computer. Um, though I hear that that's changing somewhat with some of the programs that deal with like large predictive quantitative stuff. Um, I'm thinking of programs like at Duke, et cetera. Um, so that's something I had to learn on the fly and, and kind of hand wave out a little when I was um, interviewing. Um, and then also, uh, I was totally, I had almost no notion of anything other than what I'll call causal models or things in the re regression-based framework. So I was totally ready to answer questions about um, to what extent X causes or affects Y, um, but had, had to kind of start from scratch with questions like, uh, which of these are not like the other ones? Or uh, which of these observations group together and which ones don't? Or um, which of these translations of this uh, German text is the worst? Uh, so those were kind of areas of, of data science or math or stats that I had to go kind of sort out for myself. Um, but again, I you know see my previous statement about you know, <coughs> having the confidence to just go tackle those things and not being intimidated by them. Mm -hmm. That might be it. On the uh, on the parallelization and big data thing, I, I was literally just talking to a student yesterday who has a data set that's, you know, 192 million observations, some massive number of observations, and we were sort that's of walking little, through you know, how, how to load, you know, how to chunk the data and, you know, load parts of it and then run parallelization, which I, I learned how to do in grad school, but I don't have a lot of call for that. I mean, parallelization, sure, for, for Monte Carlo simulations, but... Probably also changed since then. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's, con it's constantly... It's yeah, changed, it's constantly you know, in the last six months. Though. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's true, it's a moving target. Uh, Jay, uh, you want to go ahead? Uh, yes, so this first just to come echo a couple points. I think the point that Susan made about kind of best practices research design that you get from social science, social science PhD program, I think that's the single most underrated, under sort of uh, utilized, under focused on aspect. Uh, most of the time, especially if you're trying to go private sector, you'll see these job postings and it's like, you know, three to five years are Python, Hadoop, Spark, all the, you know, whatever. Um, but people rarely focus on like how to actually design, you know, uh, a machine learning pipeline or something from feature creation to go through the whole way through. Uh, so that, you know, I think to the extent that if you're trying to go in the private sector and you might be intimidated at a lack of, you know, software skills or, or whatever, uh, that's definitely something to focus on as a value add against people coming out of a comp sci PhD program or against people who've been in the industry forever and they've acquired those skills. Uh, so don't uh, don't underestimate that that value. The, on the flip side, from the business setting, you need to be careful to, of how you bring these up, right? So, so in, in general, I think business users, users don't, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to tell someone that they should be less certain or less confident. People always want, you know, data that I can use to increase my confidence. So you need to be a little tricky or a little careful about that. But I think that stuff kind of you'll pick those uh, skills up as you go. Um, but there's not not a real great way to learn that uh, until you've been meeting with business folks who, uh, and you'll learn how to phrase those things. Uh, in terms of the training, I wish I had in grad school. So if I was focusing purely on skills to uh, better enable a transition to the private sector, I think two things. For sure, and I cannot stress these enough to learn. And so, this is assuming that you pick up your standard stats training, your standard some exposure to machine learning, or whatever. I mean, you have to know canonical machine learning algorithms. That's, at this point, that's a non-starter. So, you know, you know, just predict the frameworks for linear models, which is regression, or for some exposure conceptually to neural nets. Yeah, you don't need to be an expert, but you need to sort of conceptually know what they are. Uh, but Additional training I wish I had would be a proper 
computer science sequence, so like an intro, a mid-level, and a next level, like fundamental, you know, guided training and best practices of, of computer science, which is something that's really hard to pick up, even with all these free things online, like really good detailed instruction there, um, and some exposure to databases. So, you know, social science, we email each other CSVs, but that's not going to work, um, you know, in a production environment. So, you know, at a minimum, a working knowledge of relational databases, and at this point, it's pretty fundamental to have at least a conceptual understanding of of unstructured databases as well. Mm, okay, yeah, that's something we definitely don't train on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. So, like, something like I looked into this: a correlates of war doesn't have like that's not a structured database, which you know blows my mind that it's still like C, like CSVs floating around. But um, those are things that your mind's able to flip completely once you uh, decide to go private, if you do. I mean, some of the things Nathan mentioned, like, for example, you know, clustering and, and some of those problems, I took a computational statistics sequence, and so I, you know, that sounded familiar. I remember doing those problems. We don't train on it in PhD programs, but it would be, that would be relatively, you know, I don't think that's sort of, that's not going to blow your mind to pick that kind of stuff up. Um, but the, the database thing, yeah, we don't train on that at all. Um, and I mean, I'm sure the people who do consulting are familiar with it, but if you're purely an academic, I'm not sure you do. Um, that would be, yeah, that's interesting. Well, the other thing I wanted to ask before we open up to, to the questions from the audience is I think the most important thing that everyone would want to know is how do you break in to a field? So if I'm, you know, if I'm advising one of my students, uh, PhD students or, or even an undergrad, that they want to, they tell me I want to do a job X, you know, how is it that you actually get started, which is the, you know, the getting your foot in the door is usually the hardest part. So why don't we go in reverse order? And Jay, why don't you get to that? Why don't you get to that one first? Yeah, for sure. So for private sector, I mean, it depends what you want to do. Um, but I think the critical thing, so if you're, if you're coming out of a PhD, if you're a top five PhD program in a top three discipline, you don't really need to worry because you'll get poached. So if you're a comp sci, Stanford, machine learning, Stanford, machine learning, Berkeley, that kind of thing, whatever. It's... You'll make so many connections in your research, it doesn't matter. Um, like for me, I was not, well, kind of Penn State people online are going to kill me, but I wasn't coming from an elite university and I wasn't coming in from one of the you know, real sexy programs, political science at, at a Big Ten university. Uh, and so I think the critical thing is you need to build a portfolio. Uh, so similar to how an artist would build a portfolio, you need some online presence. You need to demonstrate a proficiency uh, in, in running code, um, uh, you know, the more tools that you can demonstrate proficiency in and have like an open source repository where people can look at your code, the better. So if you're applying for some NLP job, like you, you really, really, really should have like a robust open source code that is a, as production ready as you can make it. That demonstrates. Is Cran going to suffice, or does it have to be GitHub or something that more? Cran's, yeah, Cran's fine. I mean, GitHub's the easiest. Right? A lot of job apps now will say, just send me a link to your GitHub repo, and that's super yeah. easy. Um, and then, you know, it just depends on what you want to do. So if you want to be like a full stack person, you, you better you know, demonstrate some full stack proficiency. If you want to be just a, you know, you know Bayesian person, then you can focus just on, on your interest. But, uh, we have some online demonstration. I think it's, it's really critical for most people. Nathan, you want to pick that up? Yeah, I mean, for um, so just echo what Jay said. You have to have a portfolio, and it's all about demonstrating this competency. And it's going to be, um, though this perception is changing, it's going to be a little more of a barrier if you want to get into a pure data science role um, coming out of a political science PhD program. Um, when I was trying to trying to break in, I got a lot of uh, political science uh, aren't those essentially historians? Like you're comfortable in an, in an armchair with a with a pipe reading a you know a history of some. Um, I do have an armchair. <laughs> decades ago, so you have to convince people that you are um, that you a have quantitative skills and not for some really weird reason, and uh, that can come from several places. Best case. Um, uh, you have some kind of pet project, or your, the project you're on in grad school has broader applicability, so you can make that public. Right? That's kind of the, the um, strongest signal that you really can do this thing. Um, I guess next best is you have work that is obviously quantitative that's in the public space. So yeah, you uh, coming out of this PhD program, I hope ideally you have a paper or two 
published that uses some kind of high-end methods that you can point to. Um, I had a co-author paper with our own Emily Ritter where uh, I could kind of point to that and say, look, I, I did all this quantitative work. Um, I'm really for real. Having something on CRAN is great. Um, uh, just kind of any kind of, um, yeah, meaningful demonstration that got this, uh, this skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the other thing I'll just add to that is um, uh, that another thing that I end up looking for when I'm like screening candidates is uh, kind of uh, creativity. So I'll, I'll, a lot of times I'll ask them like, how would you solve kind of a stock problem? And, and they should hit that one kind of out of the park. But then I'll ask them how to solve what I know to be an unsolvable problem or as, as yet unsolved problem. Uh, it's kind of a, a jerk thing to do, but it's very telling to see whether they like. Ask them why um, why uh, manhole covers are round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll say, hey, you've got you know a billion records an hour coming through, and we need an estimator of the median of that data. Mm -hmm. And they say, ah, and then they either you know shrug and and kind of give up because it's a hard question. Um, or they kind of start thinking it through and you see the little wheels turning and they start to come up with ideas about how you would do that in a streaming environment with big data and blah, blah, blah. So um, feeling free to, being able to demonstrate that creativity, it's a hard thing to kind of train to do, but it's something that's very much looked for. Okay. Uh, Susan, go ahead. Um, so I got my job at the Congressional Research Service after I heard about the vacancy through a friend, which is not the ideal way to tell you to get a job, which is like go to your friends and see where the jobs are, but it's a real way to get a job. Um, and so I would suggest, especially if you're interested in working on the Hill, like networking is a huge thing, um, that knowing, like spending some time on the Hill, I think that political scientists, especially you know, study institutions, American political institutions, should spend some time in that institution, and that that experience combined with a rigorous academic background is very valued. So if you have a chance to go work in policy for a while, you'll get to know a lot of people and you'll know where there are vacancies that you might otherwise not know about. With that being said, you can find jobs like the one I had through the Presidential Management Fellows um, program. I knew several PMFs who worked at my agency while I was there. Um, USA Jobs is kind of a bear, but also it's kind of the primary way you hear about federal jobs. And I've, I got, I spent part of my summer this last summer at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the GC's office. And um, I think I found out about that through USA Jobs. So um, if you're interested in those sorts of things, those are kind of like the three ways I would suggest getting getting to DC in a kind of hill-oriented position. Um, the thing that I would emphasize, and the thing that served me well as, you know, kind of a budding antitrust attorney as well, is this idea of being able to translate social science to non-social scientists. That was essentially my job at CRS, was to being able to, like, read, read a regression, like, read a table, like, look at a graph, and then be able to explain in terms that made sense to, essentially, attorneys why this mattered and what it meant. And so honing that skill um, and being able to demonstrate that in an interview is 100% useful. I remember I was at an interview at a different place where I, I got an offer, but I, I ended up not accepting, where I presented a paper and they were like, okay, well, what, is, what does this marginal effect mean? And I had to walk through like why it was important and what it would tell me. And these are just kind of basic skills that we take for granted because you put something on the table and everybody in your graduate program goes, oh yeah, I know exactly what that means, but the rest of the world doesn't. And so I think like the nice thing about kind of a social science education is it should hopefully give you the ability to do that. And that's exactly what people in my position at CRS are looking for. It's what um, my firm was looking for when I went to them and said, I have this quantitative social science background and I know, and I have game theoretic training. And they were like, good. Guess what? Because it's a lot of economics, and we would like you to Can translate I that. You about that? Because I, mm -hmm. I started my career um, uh, sort of specializing in game theory, and then mm -hmm. uh, gradually became a, really a quantitative methodologist. And I always thought, as a as a student of game theory, God, I, I'm either going to be a professor or nothing. <laughs> you know, like I we have <laughs> specialization. So, can you talk a little bit about how that played into your your job? Sure. Um, so antitrust is this very weird area of law where the statutory parameters of it are extremely thin. So Congress basically passed a bunch of laws that said, hey, don't monopolize the economy. 
and then left it to the courts to develop. So it's essentially kind of this weird area of judicial common law. Um, in the 70s or so, um, economic theory became kind of the main driver of the doctrine. And so you have courts and the FTC and DOJ kind of looking to economists to explain what's going on in the world, what's going to happen when a merger happens, what are the effects of certain, um, um, certain companies' behaviors. And so when you make an argument to a court or when you submit a brief or when you do research for your firm, I, you end up doing a lot of economic secondary source research, which is primarily formal. And so even though I don't write any models um, in my work for my firm, which I'm also working at part time throughout this year, um, I was able to do research um, just by being able to understand what people were writing, like the formal models that people were writing, so that I could make arguments about, you know, what the effect of like a merger was going to be. And so it, it's kind of this weird place where it's, you need people who have that sort of background, even though I'm not an economist, to translate for um, for a judicial audience that definitely doesn't have that background. Okay. Uh, Emily, so you're a professor, and, and I, I would venture to say our audience knows the most about breaking into a job uh, in our field. <laughs> but um, can you talk a little bit about um, sort of how – you know how it is that certain candidates in your search rise in a search your your department's running rise to sort of be serious competitors. Sure. So um, <clears throat> my department. Um, so there's there's two ways to think about this, right? So most departments search in subfields, or they search for um, a particular type of candidate, like they're trying to fill a particular teaching position, right. or they're trying to build a specialization in courts, or they're trying to be better in IR, or whatever they're trying to do, and they're, they're looking for a particular kind of candidate. Um, and so if you are um, applying to that kind of a search, then what's going to matter is how well you fit with what their idea is of their ideal candidate, which you have no idea what it is. Right. So the best thing you can do is to just be exactly who you are, right, and to um, convey your research idea really clearly and to talk about the different ways in which your research can apply to different kinds of subfields, but not in a way that's disingenuous because you can always tell, right? You can always say, tell that someone who studies um, only looks at the UN is not a comparativist, right? And so the um, fit is going to be a big deal, which isn't something that you can control. So instead, you should just convey what kind of a researcher you are. How is it that you think about research problems? How is it that you try to answer those problems? What looks like a puzzle to you, and how do you solve it? Um, and so being able to convey your research in that way is going to appeal across different kinds of people. Um, and even if you aren't exactly what you thought they were looking for, it's going to convey that you are a really good social scientist that is going to be valuable in that department. In my department, uh, we don't search by subfield. We search for best athlete. So our ads say, if you study political science, please apply for this job. Um, and so it means we get a really broad pool of candidates, but it means we can choose from the best of them. And um, what we're looking for is somebody who sees themselves as a social scientist, not as a graduate student. So sees themselves as someone who will be a colleague in our department, sees themselves as a researcher who's incited about the world and wants to explain things in an interesting way, can convey their ideas in creative ways, that thinks across subfields, um, so talks about institutions broadly when they study international institutions and just look at the EU in general, but they also can um, talk to the rest of us because they think about institutions in general, um, et cetera. So, um, so the, the, the biggest thing that I'm looking for is that you're not conveying that you're desperate for getting a job, and no matter what that job is, but instead you're confident in who you are as a researcher and you can convey who that is, and I can see that you're going to be, to stand on your own, you're going to do really well once you get here, and your research is going to take right off. So that's, that's what I'm looking for. And finally, uh, Michael? Um, a couple of things. First, I mean, I'll echo what, uh, what Jay said, the, uh, the sort of rude question of uh, the impossible, or uh, I guess that was maybe Nathan. Um, uh, the impossible problem. Talk me through how you think about this. That's um, that's really important. Um, being able to think through a problem, uh, 
and this is sort of hard for introverted types, myself included, sort of talk through a problem in a way that my, you know might be wrong, um, but to sort of simplify, try to attack it from different ways. That's how my interviews, uh, when, when I was a, a candidate, always were with other people who had interesting problems, uh, maybe had some idea, and they're sort of asking me, how do you think about this, this problem? Um, uh, for engineer types, I'll, or even social scientists, I'd say, you know, uh, tell me about a, a hack that you made. What trade-offs were you thinking about? We all make trade-offs in, in the research we're trying to do, uh, whether, that, whether that's social science or, or building a product. Like, we make hacks, and we, we have to justify those choices, and that's what I try to get uh, in interviews. Um, in terms of networking, I'll uh, contribute three things that I didn't hear anyone else say. Uh, the first is, um, well, I'll echo the, the GitHub one. Um, I, you know, I think that Justin sent out my LinkedIn page, which I haven't looked at in uh, at least a couple of years since we <laughs> all created them when we were trying to hire more people at Crunch. Um, <laughs> Uh, have a GitHub page, we'd ask people just to submit those. Um, have a presence on, on GitHub, contribute to open source projects. Um, my, I, in my data visualization class that I taught my favorite project uh, option, no one, no one took me up on it, was to land a, a pull request on a, a, a major package uh, like D3 or, uh, or ggplot or something. Um, Add a feature. There, there are lists. You know, sort of learn to to exist in the GitHub environment. Of hey, we have a list of features we'd like to develop. Here's a list of bugs. I said, hey, you know, pick some of these off and get those. Uh, you know, contribute to a software project. Um, I wish somebody had done that. So, so one group came close. Um, GitHub, uh, Twitter, have have a Twitter presence. Um, I I say this partly to myself. I wish mine were were better. But you engage with a lot of interesting people across disciplines. Um, you get you can pick up some some reading material you might not have have seen otherwise that will somehow inform or relate to your own work that you would not have have necessarily thought about. Uh, I I'm thinking of um, a biologist named Carl Broman. I think he's at Wisconsin who has done a lot of work porting. Uh, stuff that was sort of static in R into the interactive uh, web browser world. That's, that's directly relevant to what we do. You know, like a lot of uh, the social science replication tools or, or uh, ways we interact with data are these static reporty things or interactive in the sense of a terminal, but uh, that's not necessarily the, the whole way of the future. Mm -hmm. um, and the last is, uh, is meetups. Um, Actually, tonight, I'm bummed that I'm not in New York. Um, I sort of was considering going back this week, but uh, Hadley Wickham will be at Twitter HQ in New York, Twitter's New York uh, thing, uh, giving a talk at the R meetup there, which is excellent. I know the DC R meetup uh, is, has uh, a great group of people. I've, uh, I've been out to uh, Mountain View for a couple. I think they've hosted not R, but uh, they have Angular and they've had a D3 meetup uh, out there. Uh, actually, yeah, Hadley is a, um, at least he used to be, uh, I think he's still currently a, an adjunct professor in our statistics department, so I've seen him give a talk at Rice. Hadley is a really good speaker, um, and he's done a lot of really interesting work in, in ggplot especially, but like in his work at our studio, uh, I, I, my mantra of, uh, that I said earlier, you know, if you write a, if you use a function twice, you should write a package that comes straight from Hadley. Um, oh, I did want to add, um, um, a couple of things that I missed on the, the first round, because I went first. Uh, the things that I didn't learn in grad school, uh, how to collaborate, really, how to work with other people, directly communicate about the, the same thing, like getting on the same page with someone. You know, I never pair programmed with anyone in, in grad school. I taught a few people some things. I learned a few things uh, working with people, but it's not quite the same as working with a team. Uh, Dividing tasks and checking them off and working in small units is really refreshing. Uh, coming, I think, should apply to all of all, all of social science work too. Being able to do smallish units of work instead of here's this giant project that I don't know where to begin. 
Uh, well, we've got about uh, just a few minutes left, and I definitely want to spend some time answering uh, questions from the audience. So uh, go ahead and email your questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com, uh, or you can call 1-855-667-8287. Uh, that's one eight five five no stats, and I'm gonna uh, go to a question we received from uh, Robert. Uh, I, I can't actually read the last name. I think it might be just screwed up uh, on my screen. Uh, he says he's an MA political science student from Brazil, uh, willing to go to the U.S. Uh, so before applying to a PhD, should I keep working in the market while studying, or should I concentrate only in academic areas, publications, and so on? And uh, Emily, since you're uh, since you're working in a PhD department, why don't you why don't you tackle that one first? Um, so I don't. So if you're working in, uh, you're on your working on your PhD and you're working on trying to get publications out, um, and you're simultaneously working in the market or you're working in the, a data market, um, then there should be no reason why you wouldn't be able to succeed in a PhD program. So if you're worried about your options, it's always good to have a little backup uh, option available um, to you. But um, it should, your working in the market shouldn't hinder your ability to, to do well in the academic market if you are working on the things that are going to get you a PhD or a, a tenure track job. So that's publications on your record, networking with other political scientists um, in departments you want to work in, um, getting yourself, your name out there, um, both through social media and blogging and things like that, but also through um, the sharing of your work with other people. So if you can do those things and work in uh, another area that would build your resume so that you might have options available to you as a data scientist or whatever the case may be, then I don't see that as something that would hurt, that you don't have to give those things up in order to do well in the academic market. If doing those things is something that's hindering you from your ability to publish, uh, get things under review, to be able to meet up with people who are political scientists uh, in academic programs, then maybe you can double back a little bit. I have to say that, you know, so we have a graduate program as well, and if you're applying to a PhD, um, you definitely don't have to have publications. That's quite unusual. It does happen. Um, but uh, you should be focusing on, you know, developing a profile that's going to make you look like an appealing student, you know, sort of it's going to be engaged in what we're doing here. And often that, sometimes that involves things that are out there, you know, in the market, um, but often it involves things that you're doing academically. So, if, you know, if you're looking forward to applying to a PhD program, I think it does make sense to specialize in, in things that are going to be appealing to the programs that want to admit you. Um, I'm sorry, I think I misheard the question. Um, so if he's looking for a PhD program, is that what you're saying? Yeah, he's, he wants to, he's an MA student who wants to enter a PhD. Okay. So if he wants to enter a PhD uh, program, then you don't have to give up your pursuits. Yeah, you can just tailor, um, you, what you should do is to tailor what you do into social science questions, right? To, to be able to appeal to uh, a, a PhD program, then um, we want to know that you can think like a political scientist and know what it means to be a social scientist instead of somebody who just looks at data all the time, right? And so to, to be able to think in terms of questions and to think in comparative ways and things like that, you can write letters and have other people write letters that suggest that you do that, right, and think that way. So um, I have a question from Yulia, uh, and this is for the non-academics in the, or the currently non-academics in the audience or in the, in the panel. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a non-academic job compared to an academic one? And would you go back to an academic career if you know if you could at will do that? Would you would you want to do that? And Michael, why don't you go ahead and start with that? Um, I'm very happy not uh, being an academic. I've been around it my whole life. My dad's a professor of geography. No. Um, <laughs> I, I would say the the biggest advantage is not being tied to a university, well, many of which are in places that I don't want to live. Um, the even bigger advantage uh, for me being on a remote team is I can actually be anywhere. I, you know, extend my vacation and you know maybe work from a Airbnb, but like I can, I, I'm not tied to a place, uh, and that's you know. A, a, source of a huge amount of anxiety uh, in the, the academic job market. It was for for me, um, you know, partners, etc. Like you don't want to have to coordinate that. It's it's really hard. It, it was that made my life so much easier. Um, I 
still get to, uh, in a startup environment, you work really hard. Uh, assistant professors work really hard, um, but the measures of success are a little different. Um, it, it, it's a lot more sort of uncertainty in life about what you're, uh, what you're trying to accomplish and uh, sort of faster paced change, uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. um. I, we actually have a ton of questions coming in, and we're almost done. So I want to ask one more, uh, one last question, um, uh, and then what I'm gonna, I think what I'm going to do is just you know, if you guys want to email us individually, you can uh, at least you can email me. Feel free to do that. Um, so uh, Justin, do you want to leave the option for some of us to hang out if we can? Oh yeah, if you want to stay here longer, that's that's fine with me. I just you know I, I know people have, have uh, also, set times. Yeah, also, if these uh, questions get posted somewhere public, I'm happy to pick off a few of them in writing as, as I have time. That's yeah, we, we've talked about doing a sort of an ask me anything or a chat or some sort of way to extend the conversation beyond the, the colloquium. Uh, I just haven't, you know, I've only got so many hours in the day. <laughs> Come on, Justin. Uh, right. Come on, man. Pick it up. Um, so uh, uh, let me, uh, somebody asked about, uh, in terms of having an online presence, uh, like a Git, GitHub, What's a good piece of code? So Jay, what's a yeah. good piece of code? Uh, I feel pretty strongly that so you're not going to be able to, to demonstrate proficiencies in everything at once. It's going to take time to build those skills. It's the best good piece of code is the thing that is most interesting to you. If you like Bayesian statistics, do a Bayesian thing. If you like neural networks, do a neural net thing. If you like visualizing uncertainty, do a visualization thing. So really focus on what you like the most and do that first because it's it, it'll be more interesting to you and uh, you'll probably do a better job and there's a likelihood that that will transition into a job and someone will want to hire you to do that thing so you better like what you're posting. And uh, do you, do uh, Nathan, do you have any thoughts about what a good piece of GitHub code is? I am almost certain I've never written a good piece of code. Um, Mike and Jay <laughs> probably know a lot better. They might be closer to closer real developers than I am. I uh, for me, to a good piece code. of code is you know <laughs> just like a good dissertation. It's it's the one that's finished. It um, you know you can then optimize it and tweak it and handle edge cases kind of after the fact. Um, a lot of the stuff I've been involved with has moved so quickly or the turnaround time has been so short that uh, there wasn't there wasn't always time to do it exactly right. You know, rather you just had to be comfortable slapping something together that you were pretty sure was going to be giving you the right answer. There are trade-offs and hacks everywhere. <laughs> Acknowledging them. And so the good piece of code acknowledges those. Um, uh, on the like having a presence and being uh, doing something, I, I uh, would totally echo what what Jay said. Um, some of, there are these great blog posts that are just, hey, I feel like learning this thing, and I'm going to document how I learn it. So like when ggplot first came out, there was a dude who blog posted uh, translating all of the lattice examples to ggplot. And that like I've still referred to that from 2009. Like, oh, that's how you how you do those different things in, in two different languages. And you just sort of as you learn, you make it public and be embarrassed about it later. But you probably won't be. You'll you might refer to your own stuff. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna add two things. So, I think there are some quality benchmarks you want to hit before you make it public. So I would absolutely let a friend who uh, is a trusted friend try to run it and try to break it because if, if the potential employer runs it and it breaks, like that's almost worse than not posting it. Right. Uh, and also follow a style guideline. So uh, academics don't really do this, but just Google, whatever language you're going to write in, if it's R, Python, State, or whatever, just Google that language style guideline and you'll they'll see a bunch and pick one and generally it's safe to pick one that is supported by a, the biggest company because that's mm -hmm. generally the most likely to be widely used and and follow that. You can cheat by using Emacs. <laughs> mm. uh, okay, so I'm going to hold the webinar open past uh, noon. So so Ara, do not do not cut us off here yet. But uh, for those of you who you know have a lunch hour and have to get back, well this will be the formal end of the of the program. But we still have some questions uh, and as long as you guys are willing to hang out, I wanna I wanna get through some of these questions because I think this is really valuable for people to hear. So I have a question for Susan from uh, Patrick. Uh, how do you? What if you want to break into empirical legal studies, but you're not a lawyer? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think a lot of political scientists kind of do things like that that are not lawyers. So, I mean, I think empirical legal studies is just generally 
you know, trying to answer questions in the law with data, right? So if you can identify a question in the law and collect data on it, um, you know, I think that's the project of a lot of the judicial subfield. Um, you know, if, if you have questions about, like, what constitutes a good, you know, empirical legal studies paper, like, look to the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies or look for quantitative uh, work in law journals, which may sometimes horrify you. Um, but that would be a good example of what kind of scholars who are doing empirical stuff in the law are, are working on. Um, I don't know, with that being said, yeah, I'll stop there. I mean, are there Thank firms, you. Susan, are there firms that, that you would do um, empirical legal studies that isn't an academic type pursuit that you wouldn't be in a tenure track kind of position but would instead be working for a firm or consulting firm that's not a law firm or, you know, are those mm -hmm. things that are out there? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, there are non-profits who do similar types of things. So if, like, you're interested in courts, the National Center for State Courts is a great um, nonprofit that works and trains state judges all over the nation. It's a big um, source of empirical research on the law and courts at the state level. Um, there are several court-oriented nonprofits. Um, I think the Center for Court Innovation is one based in New York. CRS is a kind of a federal one where you can do similar work. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, economics consulting firms that um, work with data that firms use, that law firms use. Yeah, I'll just say one, one thing since I've, I've been kind of doing that in the legal capacity as a data scientist for a few years. Uh, if you're trying to go for a profit, um, maybe email me. There's a bunch of kind of boutique data science-y, NLP-ish, uh, uh, legal analytics companies out there that I can mm. have to point something to. And there are also, you know, it's worth mentioning, we have a lot of Emory connections here. There are, there are specific PhD programs that specialize in empirical legal studies. Emory is one of them, but there are others. And if you really thought that that's some, the kind of thing you wanted to get into, you know, I think it would be advisable to you know, if you're not already in a PhD program, to, to go to one of those places. Not that that's a not that that's a definitive barrier or something, but it, it helps just to get to know the people working in the field. Uh, I want to ask this question, which I think is really interesting for the people um, working outside of academia. So, if someone writes in that they're in a smaller PhD uh, department uh, with limited methods training, and uh, they've used uh, quantitative methods in their own research, but most of it is self-taught. Uh, I tend to learn methods as I need them. How can I emphasize to potential non-academic employers uh, that I'm a motivated learner and can adapt to the situations that arise? And so, you know, Jay mentioned, you know, if you're a if you're a hotshot at Harvard or Stanford or whatever, you know, this, you know, whatever, you're going to be fine. But what if what if you're uh, what if you're coming out of a program that isn't known for you know pumping out people straight to Silicon Valley? And uh, well, why don't we start with uh, we'll start with Jay since you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, I would say there are currently a ton of free. So if you wanted two, two, two good options, one is well, different options. One is there's tons of data science boot camps. They're like month long intensive programs. They're really expensive. They're like twenty grand. Their placement rates are really high. Uh, that's always an option. I would you say that's an option of last resort. The option of first resort is there are tons of free online learning places. So the course I always recommend to people is Andrew Ng's Coursera Intro to Machine Learning course. I take, that. <laughs> yeah, take, take that, do all the assignments, uh, and the core thing I would recommend there is prove to your employers that you understand the concepts you learn and that you can apply them to something not explicitly taught in the course. So take, take something that, that you learn in the course and apply it to some data set that you found write a nice little some code around that and put it online or blog about it. Uh, so because the core thing you're going to have to do is demonstrate to employers that, okay, you, you would realize that you don't have uh, maybe as strong a formal training as someone coming out of a you know, bigger name university or whatever, but you have sought out other resources, you have learned them, and you have applied them to other domains. You know, in, in, in methodology, um... Uh, it, it, we have a similar thing where some people come out of schools that are not known as methodology powerhouses and uh, how do you sort of break into the community when you're in that situation and my advice has always been publish in political analysis because if you can publish in political analysis chances are you know that's identifies you as the kind of person that has the skills 
that needs to that you need to succeed. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of public, you know, if you, since you're in an academic environment, is there any kind of publication that you can signal having those skills? So, do you guys, when you're hiring, do you, do you does that matter? Is that important or or what? Mm. The discipline journals is tough. I mean, if you get a big time pub in like Nature or something, yes, oh, but, not. <laughs> but <laughs> right. other than that, I, I'd say don't worry about publications. Oh, seriously, it's science yeah, or bust. Okay. Yeah, Michael, this, this, is, this is tough. I mean, earlier, I think I think um, we kind of had a conversation with one student who is in an MA program and trying to figure out how to get into a PhD program and and whether it, he was having to make trade offs or not. Um, some of these things are are not just just um, you can't always just do more. Some of these things are different, right? If you, if you really have decided you want to go to an academic track, you don't need to spend time shaking hands at data science meetups. Um, but if you if you do want to um, leave the academic track and get a gig as a data scientist, that's exactly what you need to do. And so I think some of this just militates for uh, deciding earlier what it is that's going to make you happy, whatever whatever you expect that to be, and, and kind of you know chasing that thing. So I know that's vague and cliched advice, but um, it's because you can't simultaneously optimize the best dissertation possible while you make as many connections in the DC area as you can, right? That got limited time. I'm gonna I'm gonna end with this question. Um, so someone sent in a question saying uh, it's it's easy to be very pessimistic about jobs uh, in general, uh, especially if you're a post if you're a PhD, right? Uh, uh, humanities is a little in, in more dire shape, but uh, sometimes the future seems bleak. Is there something you know? Can you? Is there something you can say that is sort of communicates your experience with going through this process? That uh, is, um, uh, how do you say? What, what would you? What would you? What would you? What, and if you could summarize how you would sort of one piece of advice you would give to a person coming out who's on the cusp of getting their PhD, what would it be? So we'll just go around the table and and do that before we end. So Michael, why don't you go first? Um, that you have as as. Uh, Brutal as the academic job market can be, you have uh, skills that are broadly applicable elsewhere. Um, that I think, as a grad student, you don't realize that you that you actually had time to to sit and think really hard about uh, about problems and develop these kind of skills that we that we've been talking about. Especially, you know, if you're listening to a, to a technical meetup or you know, our little technical, fairly technical colloquium, um, that you're totally employable, uh, even if the academic job market makes it seem like you're not. <laughs> Emily, do you have have any uh, have any uh, words of wisdom for the, the the job seekers out there? Um, I know that it's hard to do, but if you can not get mired in what you're not getting, and instead spend time work continuing to work, then it'll eventually work out. Right, so uh, whether it's a job in academia or outside of academia, you have to continue producing so that the world can see what you can do, right? And so um, instead of looking at e-jobs every day, if you can look just one day a week and instead spend the other six days of the week publishing, working on code, putting things out there, meeting people, then the, there are ways to to get what you need, which is a job uh, in one way or another. So um, to um, obsess over it isn't going to get you a job, but continuing to work is, is going to get you a and, job. And, you know, there's, I don't know, there's some business help book that says something like, you know, what got you here won't get you the next place. And I think many of us got where we are now by being super obsessive, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best. <laughs> Michael, you wanted to... Uh, also, don't read the rumors blogs. Like, oh, don't read the rumors blogs. Add it to the host file so your browser just won't open it. Do not read it. <laughs> the hive of villainy. Yeah. Uh, Su Susan, uh, do you have any advice? I mean, I think uh, just figuring out what. I mean, a lot of this advice has been around. You know, Nathan was just like, you can't optimize multiple things at once, and. You know, some of the other advice was, well, if you want to do a certain type of programming, like focus on that, or a certain type of work, focus on that. And I guess my advice would just be figure out what you really like and then do it well. Um, don't, don't try to, as Emily said earlier, don't try to be everything to everybody. You know, just put forward a focused, maybe even narrow version of, you know, your best, your best self. That sounds kind of self-helpy, but you know, you want to show that you're going to do really well at, at what 
you're interested in. And so try not to stretch yourself too thin on paper or too thin in an interview is important. And then, you know, focus your search towards those things that are good fits. I just also want to mention um, really briefly on a very pragmatic level, feel free to reach out to people that aren't hiring. Um, both my first gig and the gig I just moved to were not actively hiring whatsoever. Um, and I got my first job because I sent them a cold email saying, I think you do A, I do B, here's how B could help A, here's my cover letter. And the HR person was literally putting it in the recycling bin when the guy who ended up hiring me was like, oh, I'll have a look at that. Hmm. So, that's interesting. Um, and I, that's, that's common, at least in my industry, at least in the DC area, is um, that people don't, sometimes don't want to advertise for jobs because they'll just get swamped. Emily? Both of the jobs that I have gotten have been, uh, I, I met people at them before they were ever hiring um, and, and got to know them and they got to know my work before they were ever hiring and so then when they were hiring my application moved higher even though I didn't have publications on it. So I, I would totally agree with Nathan that you should not ignore people who are not hiring because you never know when they will be. And one other thing is uh, we know when you're doing that, you know, like it's, I think, uh, <laughs> suck, sucking up is a very identifiable activity, so, so don't do that. Uh, it, does, it doesn't work. Uh, Jay, do you have any words of wisdom to yeah, pass just on? To echo some things and then say a couple other things. Uh, echo Susan's point, do things that you like. I think that is like absolutely true. If you post stuff that's awesome and people want to hire you for it, but you hate doing it, well, if they hire you, you're going to have to do it. So if there's things you don't like doing, I mean, shy away from those and focus on the things you really love. And if what you really love is like a super narrow optimization of a deep neural network, wherever there's someone right now that's going to hire you to do it. Um, if it's totally ridiculous, and maybe don't do it, but if it's something that like, you've ever seen on a job posting ever, uh, that's fine. Just just do it. Um, and to Nathan's point as well, like I absolutely, if especially if you're trying to go private sector, look up companies that might be doing what you're doing and stalk LinkedIn and find people at those companies who you think are senior enough to be in a hiring position and you think might be doing something tangentially related to what you're doing and just email them. Email them your resume, email them your GitHub profile. Uh, almost every company within, so I'm in Mountain View, almost every company within 100 miles of here is currently hiring data scientists, mm -hmm. um, and people love getting uh, getting resumes, so absolutely do that. And the last point I will add is, especially if you're trying to go private sector, coming out of a PhD program, uh, as an entry-level data science job, you're going to be competing with a lot of people who just finished a one-month-long boot camp, and those people got, like, a lot of training on basic level how to do things, how to interview how to kind of play the game that you won't have gotten. Uh, and so you need to make sure that whatever those programs teach, you can do, and also to demonstrate the extra value you got in your PhD program uh, for your own sanity so you don't get frustrated with less qualified people get the jobs, and also uh, it will make you a much more, uh, a much stronger candidate in the whole process. Well, uh, I, I think, uh, well, first I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you for staying uh, longer to answer questions. I'm sure everyone really appreciated that. Uh, I also want to apologize to Marianne. Despite our Herculean efforts, we were not able to make her software work. So I apologize. We couldn't get any. Uh, she was going to talk about the liberal arts college market, and that, it sucks that she, she wasn't available. Uh, but I apologize to her for that. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to have Kentaro Fukumoto. Uh, uh, giving a talk at the IMC, so uh, we've we posted this paper online. Uh, so I hope you'll uh, uh, join us next week at uh, noon, uh, noon Eastern, uh, 11 Central. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming. Really appreciate it, and uh, good luck to all those job seekers out there. Good luck, guys. Thanks, Justin. Thanks. 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 See you next time. Thanks.